to turn our attention to a, a scripture out of uh, the vine. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to do it out of John 15. We're going to look at verse 1, and we're going to read beyond that. Um, but you can just hold your finger in there for just a second, because i got to do a setup for you, okay? And i got to do a setup, because you got to understand the context out of which you look at this particular passage. Now, first of all, you got to understand that this is really uh, part of Jesus' training model as he comes to John chapter 15. If you ever studied in there and asked the question, how in the world did Jesus build disciples? There are really four distinct characteristics that happened when Jesus began to build his disciples, and they're important for us just to remember. And, and all of you, uh, you know, are, are Bible students, so I understand that you would know these, but you can watch these as clear distinctions as they go through. When Jesus begins to call in a life, Jesus calls in a life and, and does so with ever-increasing levels of commitment, you see. And so the first real commitment that Jesus called for was a really a non-commitment. It came out of John chapter 1, verses 35 through 39. It was a time at the very beginning of his ministry, and John the Baptist, those guys who were following John the Baptist, came in, and what they did was they saw Jesus, and they were intrigued by him, and they came, and they didn't know what to ask Jesus, and they said, so where are you staying, right? And Jesus said, well, come and see. Come and see. No real level of commitment. No, no, nothing required of them. Just simply come and see. And, and that first call to discipleship is simply that. It's come and see. And what happens is oftentimes we miss this piece of discipleship because we get the second one all the time. But this come and see is probably one of the more important ones for us as we begin to look and ask the question, how are we going to build a church in the 21st century? Because what happens here at Shepherd of the Hills is we have struggled with how to create a culture of come and see. We come in and we realize that when people walk in the door, we jump on them, we pounce on them. Oh, good, we need somebody to make coffee. Come in and do that. that you know, people are coming in their door, and they're walking in our doors. And I don't know if they're walking in your doors, but they're walking in our doors, and they have no concept, okay, none of what this is about. They just know they need something. And we've begun to realize that, and it's been a hard transition in our church to begin to think about it. But Jesus started with this come and see, and it was an important part of his ministry. He didn't require anything of him. Come on. Just come on. See what community is like. See what it's like, you see. And Andrew was one of the first of the two who came in. Now, later on, he brought Peter, right? And what we found is that those folks who have the gift, the time and the gift of come and see that they are some of our best people because they're inviting other people. Come and see this thing that God's doing, right? And so the first step on this discipleship program that Jesus had for these people was to come and see. The second one is the one that you're probably very familiar with, and it comes out of Mark chapter 1. It's also in the other Gospels, and this is when Jesus calls them to a deeper level of commitment, and he picks out a few, and he says, come and follow me. Come and follow me. And then when he said, come and follow me, there were a lot of things he needed to do. Number one, he needed to teach them. He needed to take them back to the basics and talk about it. And he would say things like this, the kingdom of heaven is like this. He would begin to teach them. And he would begin to teach them about living in community and how it was to live in community. He would teach them about God. He was teaching them all about those kind of things. He said, come and follow me. The third step in his discipleship program came later when he said, come and be with me. And this is when he called people into ministry with him. You see, he never let the disciples, all his planning along there was come and follow me. But we got him to a point, he knew if they just took in what they were having and never in any way gave out, then they, they would be stillborn as disciples of Jesus Christ. He said, come and be with me. And here's what he did. He called him in and he said, look, you've watched me heal. You've watched me teach. you watched me do that. I want you to go out in my name. Now, they were a little scared, not really sure what was going to go on. And then he made it even harder. He said, I only want you to take one pair of set of clothes. <laughs> now, what? <laughs> Just one set of clothes. That's all I, I want you to take. I don't, I don't even want you to take a staff or a tunic or anything like that. And then he goes, I don't even want you to take any money. What? You just, we're not heavily resourced here? <laughs> no. No, you're not. 
you're just people who have been following me, and now I want you to come and be with me in my ministry. And he sent them out. And you can watch this transition that occurs in them because they come back, and you know the story. They come back praising God for all he's done in and through them. Because he gave the ministry away. And Jesus was all about in the training program of giving that ministry away. And it's very important that we understand that across the discipleship program. Because if we are truly in the business of making disciples, this is how Jesus did it. Now, having said that, he's done that. He worked them through. It's a three-year process where he works them through. The fourth thing that he does is he says this, I want you to remain in me. Okay, And that's the passage that we're going to look at today. It's a passage that comes out of John chapter 15, and we're going to look at it where he talks about the vine and the branches. Now, I love this passage because in a former life, I was a horticulturist. Yeah, that's right. I went to A&M, Texas A&M, home of the fighting Texas Aggies, and I just want you to say there was a Heisman Trophy. Did you all know this? There was a Heisman <laughs> Trophy winner this year that came out of there, and so it did. But I, I was in, in a... a, a horticulture, and I graduated with horticulture, and I love Jesus's horticultural imagery. And he does it all the time. He gives them all sorts of little farming tips, right? And he's telling them, just like he does the fishermen, you know, ah, throw it on the other side. And, and anybody who had been fishing very long would have resented it royally, but Jesus did it. He does the same thing with farming. He uses that. Now, what happens is, as we grow more urban as a society, we lose that insight into what Jesus would say. And the things that they were talking about were things that they would have intuitively gotten, okay? So we're going to look at this passage, and I know you look at it a lot of different ways and a lot of different times. We're going to look at it from a horticulturist point of view, okay? Will you let me do that a little bit with you? Okay, thank you. Because we're going we're gonna to begin to look at that. But before we do, I don't want to leave this without telling you this. This is a plan that I've watched Jesus work with his disciples. And I believe it's a plan that works for us as we begin to do it. One of the things that a church needs to do, just by way of instruction a little bit, is to begin to build a ladder so that each of these are in place. So that we are moving people along in the level of discipleship. Okay? So if you haven't got a place in your church where you can come and see, i got to tell you, they won't. Okay? If you haven't got a place where you call people to a deeper discipleship and say, come and follow me, I want you to tell you, they won't. If you won't, aren't beginning to hand off the ministry to other people and beginning to train them and give them the ability to do that, to come and be with me, they won't. And part of the hard work for those of us who are responsible for the church is to go backfill into the church and ask the thing, let's look at everything we do. Is it happening here? Right? But I want you to know also, and this is the second thing I want you to know before we turn to the scripture, this is just totally an aside that this isn't a linear process. Let me give you one story to illustrate that, and then we'll move along. When I was in my 20s, I, I started work. It was my first experience of full-time ministry. It was at Westlake Prez. That church brought me into the church. I hadn't been a part of a church, came to Christ at, in a parachurch organization, thought the church was a racist organization, didn't want to be a part of it, didn't want anything to do it. That church loved me into the ministry, and I will always be eternally grateful for that church doing that to me. I ended up being the youth minister there. And right in the middle of the youth ministry time there, my dad got sick. He, he was at Stanford Medical Center and had a brain tumor, and he had an operation. And I had put in 100 hours a week serving the Lord, and now I disseminated that information to every prayer list across the country that I could think of. We were going to pray for my dad, for healing for my dad, and here's the upshot. He died. What? What? Really? Haven't I served you well, Lord? Haven't I done this with everything I, I have inside of me? Didn't I put you on every prayer chain? Haven't you heard from God's people about my dad and he died? Are you kidding me? And I remember walking around the Stanford campus. And I had a crisis of faith like I've never had before or since where I could not understand what God was doing. Maybe, maybe this prayer thing doesn't work. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe none of that stuff works. Maybe that's all just hooey, right? Some friends of mine flew in from Austin 
two buddies of mine. We took a long walk together. And they were very good and very wise because they understood this. And they said to me, Larry, just feel what you need to feel. It's okay. We'll have faith for you. And they did. They let me have it. My church let me have it. Because I had to go back and see once again. Lord, is this really real? Help me to see this. Help me to know what this is about. Help me to know what it knows to follow you, even when you've gone through a crisis like that. Help me to know that stuff. This stuff isn't linear. It's cyclical. And all of us are going to work through that at some point. You see, Peter, the one, Jesus, I'll never leave you, forsake you. And Jesus turns to him, oh, yeah, you will. Yeah, 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 yeah you will. <laughs> right. And so you see all this begin to take place in his life. And it's something that's important to us. Now I want us to turn to the scripture. It comes out of John chapter 15. It's one of the longest uh, soliloquies of Jesus. He, he gives us uh, a, a, an insight into his love for his disciples as he does so at the end of his life. He's sharing communion with him. What I want to do is I want to read it. And then I want to just give you a little context. And then I want to give you three applications. And with each of the applications, I want to give you a prayer. So let's go to this time of Scripture as we get ministered to by the book of John. I want you to read along with me in silence. <laughs> if you want to speak out, go ahead, but it's up on the screen. I am the true vine, Jesus said, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean, he said, because of the word I have spoken to you. You don't need to worry about that. Remain in me as I also remain in you. You see, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Remember, this is the last lesson he's giving his disciples before they leave. Let's look at this. I am the vine, you are the branches, he says. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire, and they're burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, well, then ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Almighty God, uh, we don't need another sermon. Well, we need one like a hole in the head. What we need, Lord, is to desperately hear from you. Because we're going into a time where we're together, we're going to be dispersed tomorrow back to our churches, and we need to know of your presence. I thank you for the chance to gather together and worship you, and I pray that you might be with us in the next moments. In Jesus' name, amen. The, the, the winemaking business is a huge business. And especially it is in California, Napa Valley. Some of you had the opportunity to go to Napa Valley and seen the winemaking business there. You travel vineyard after vineyard after vineyard in that incredible microclimate that produces some of the best wines in the world. And in that place where it produces the best wines in the world, it almost didn't happen. Back in the 1800s, the fledgling wine industry in the United States was just starting in Napa Valley. And they came over and brought some um, vines over from uh, Italy and France primarily. And they brought them over and they planted them and they flourished for a few years. And then they all began to die. And here's why they began to die. There was a tiny little thing called phylloxera that attacked the plant. And it began to tear up the vines and eat them up. 
And the, the bad thing was Napa was almost completely wiped out of its vines. And everybody said it will never grow here. One of the other sad things about it is on a trip back to, uh, to France, somebody carried with them one of these small little bugs, the phylloxera, and they went over and it affected the French wine industry and the Italian wine industry. We almost had no wine industry anywhere in Western Europe or in the United States because this thing attacked. And they were desperately trying to figure out what to do about that. And so what they did was they began to look and say, are there any vines that are growing anywhere that are going to be of any use to us? And so they went out into the woods in Northern California, and they began to see that the wild vines weren't affected by this. And so what they did was they took the wild vines, and they planted them all over their vineyards, and then they went back to France and Italy, got some pieces of their favorite grapes, and they brought them back over to California, and they grafted them in to the vines that were there. The natural California vines were not affected by the phylloxera. And because of that, they were able to grow in the flourishing wine industry, which is all over California, and literally in Italy and in France and much of Western Europe, comes from California rootstock of, of vines that are there. Now, uh, here's what happened. All the people who are listening to Jesus get vines. They understand grapes. They know this, okay? It's just built into the wolf and warp of their lives. They understand it. And so they get some things that you may not see, although you might, but I'm going to just kind of lift them up for you. But first, let me explain the process. Now, my prop budget was pretty low. <laughs> okay. So here's what you got. What you do is you go, and when you want to graft something on, you go and find the kind of grape you want, and you take a cutting off of it, okay? And when you take a cutting off of it, it's called a scion, an S-C-I-O-N, okay? And a scion is just a piece and a cutting that you're going to take off a grapevine. And what they do is they cover it with wax on both ends, and then they ship it over in large bundles, so here is the California rootstock, and what they do is they come in and they make a cut that's like a T in the rootstock when the bark is moving. And that's what happens in the spring. For those of you who have ever been in, around the business, you'll know. You can take the bark and actually go like this, and it moves around the plant. When it's moving, you can go in and cut there, and then you make a small cut on the end of the scion, and you put them together. Okay? You get that? You wrap them up, and what happens is, on a cellular level, this rootstock and this branch begin to grow together, and you can actually look in the microscope at that, that wound that is healing and the healing that's around it, okay? And so you take that scion, and you begin to put it in, and you, and you make the graft. Now, in this particular case, that's a bud graft up here. Most of you would take this log stick, and you would put it together, and you would do that. Now, the, this is the grape you want. It's a Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon or Cabernet Franc or, or, or uh, you know, something, that, Pinot Noir, something like that, okay? Because that's what's going to grow out of here. And whatever you choose is that. It's going to live and become what it was intended to be, but it's just grafted onto a different vine so that it can live effectively. Now, I want you to know that it's entirely possible you can take this and you can plant this in the ground and it will develop roots and it will grow up. But here's what you need to know. It will grow, develop leaves and it will never fruit like the person who owns the vineyard wants it to under its own power. The people who are listening to Jesus would understand this intuitively, okay? And they would understand what was happening there because he is saying, I am the vine, you are the branches, I have put you in and grafted you in. This really comes out of Romans chapter 11, but you have been grafted into this vine and now all of your sustenance, all that makes you who you are so that you can become what you were intended to be, a Merlot grape, comes from this. You get it? You guys are sharp. <laughs> there are a couple lessons I want to teach you. For all those who are listening, they would understand this because they had been in the grapevines for so long. And it's this. The graft is the strongest part of the branch. Here's what I know. 
Once it's been grafted, if you come and pull on this, we might think it's going to break right here, but it's not. It's going to break anywhere along this branch except the graft. And anybody listening to Jesus would hear this, that this graft that God has done as the gardener is so strong that nothing can break it. Did you hear that? Nothing can break it. And that healing that takes place there is something that's so strong. I learned this when I was a dad, you know. My young son uh, is going. I'm learning to walk with him. I'm trying to learn how to be a dad. And he likes to walk up these, uh, this, this wall that was near our house. And he would walk up. And inevitably, when he got to the top, he would stumble, right? And here's what I learned about small kids. When they stumble, instead of grabbing harder under your hand, what do they do? They let go, right? The natural instinct is to catch ourselves. And here's what I learned as a dad. That when they start to stumble, I just need to grab them harder. Because I had the strength to hold on to them. Here's what you need to know Jesus is going to say about your heavenly parent. God who loves you so much, who sent his son to die for you. If you were the only type person in time and space, he still would have come to die for you. Right? And here's what you need to know, that he will not let you go. And all those people who are listening to Jesus, who understand vines, they would have said, that's so right. So what's the prayer? The prayer can simply be this. Lord, thank you. It could be nothing more. It's not because of our own devices or anything that we did or anything else. It's because the divine gardener has come in and grafted us onto the place where strength comes. And that's the vine, the true vine, it says. And that's in Jesus Christ. And all we can do is say thank you. I don't know if you came here today prepared to say thank you. But I want you to know before we go to work, probably the most important thing you can do is just take a moment. And I'm going to give you a moment. So your prayer is this, if you want to pray it, Lord, thank you for your divine care. There's a second thing I learned as a horticulturist watching this thing. It's this, that pruning is an integral part of the life with God. Now, here's the deal. If you want this to grow, you'll grow, and what happens is this will grow maybe 15 feet in one year, right? So every year about this time, you have to come back, and you have to find a few buds that are viable, and you cut it back. And Jesus says this of you, everyone will be pruned, okay? Here's what I want you to know, that to the plant that feels violent... To have something cut off yourself just feels violent. And yet, a pruning is an integral part of a life with God. In fact, those buds will never grow and produce fruit unless you're pruned. And this is not something I like. It's part of the natural process, in fact, that I don't like. And yet, Jesus says it's going to happen to each one of us. And it does so. Why out of his love, he desires something so much better. You see, his whole goal is for you to be fruitful. So here's your prayer. Lord, I desire to be fruitful in my life and ministry with you. Prune away. I desire to be fruitful in my life and ministry prune away. Whatever you need to do, whatever keeps me from being there, whatever keeps me from doing that, Lord, take it away. You see, because that is part of what it means to remain in me. I've asked the hard question over the years whether that's what God's doing with our denomination. When I came in 1978, we had 4 million people. We're going to have about 1.8 million this year. 
We've sustained losses of about 60, 40 to 60,000 people every year ever since I've been a part of this denomination. Now, am I the cause of it? Perhaps. <laughs> right? I realize and hold, I understand that I came in about the time we started doing it. Okay, so, so you, you have this and you go, oh, now, whether that is in fact what's happening with our denomination, I have not been able to answer. Whether it's just sociologic causality or whether it's divine causality, you're going to have to figure out. But I've always wondered about it for us. But I do know this. It's a part of a life with God. And when we get to the point of remaining me and say, Lord, prune away, we got to understand he'll take us at our word. And that'll happen. But you see, the whole desire for the gardener is to be fruitful. The last thing I need to tell you as a horticulturist is this. The flower has to fall off before the fruit can develop. <laughs> what happens is every time you have a plant, especially peach trees or, or cherry trees or whatever, they get these gorgeous flowers on them and it smells so good to walk in the garden and all these kind of things. And all of us would just love for the cherry blossoms to be there all the time. But in order for the cherry to form, the flower has to fall off. And what happens for us in ministry is we hold on very tightly to the form of God and his ministry, and we want to hold on. We want the church that's flourishing. We want everything to look perfect, and we want it all to look good, and we want to see all those things that make the flower of ministry there. And here's what any horticulturist knows. It's got to fall off in order to be fruitful. It's got to fall off. And the reason is, is because God wants to build in us the fruit of the Spirit. And he does so by being connected to the vine because all the nutrition flows through there and out into the fruit. And he prunes off whatever doesn't work that way. Galatians 5 says this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's what God wants to build in you. Your last prayer would be this. Lord, make me fruitful. Not for my own self, but so that I can be of service to you. Lord, make my community, the church that I'm a part of, be fruitful. Lord, please bring that blessing down upon us. If you need to prune us, prune us. But Lord, we want to be fruitful. And that should be the prayer of our heart. It is not simply self-serving for my own personal peace and affluence. It's because God has called me to be fruitful. And his greatest joy is for you to be fruitful. For love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control, all those things to be flowing out of you. Because when it happens, it changes the world. And it changes our hearts because of what God's done in Jesus Christ. Jesus says it this way. I am the vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's pray together. Almighty God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. I'm thankful for their love that they have for you, and I pray that you might make them fruitful. That's all I can ask for them today, Lord. Anything that would keep them from doing that, Lord, prune it off. Lord, give them a heart of gratitude and thankfulness that they are connected to the vine because that's you, Lord. And Lord, for that we're thankful. And we pray all these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying...